we're going to jump right into it. Uh, as always, feel free to ask questions in, in the Zoom. I will be monitoring that as we go. And uh, so feel free to interrupt me and, and just shout out questions as we got them. And we'll get into it. We're going to talk about CICD pipelines for microservices and best practices that we've learned. Uh, so first off, to introduce myself, my name is Dan Garfield. I am the Chief Technology Evangelist for CodeFresh. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Today Was Awesome, uh, where I mostly just talk about Kubernetes and microservices and uh, my home built cluster and stuff like that. Uh, I'm a Google Cloud developer expert focused on cloud. And I'm also a member of the Forbes Technology Council. I guess that badge is actually out of date. It's 2020 now, not 2018. So, <laughs> but uh, but that's that's what I that's who I am and what I do. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit of a case study that uh, I did with uh, uh, an old teammate of mine around Expedia's journey to microservices um, and then how we do it at CodeFresh as well. Um, so first of all, to explain why microservices, I have an analogy that I like to use. I don't know if it's totally helpful. At this point, maybe everybody totally gets it. If it's boring, shout it in the chat that it's boring. But uh, uh, I really love space travel and I love the stories of the space race and uh, getting to the moon and everything. And any space nerd knows that this is a picture of Apollo 13. What you can see, there are essentially two different ships. There is the uh, lunar module, which is on the left-hand side. That's what they're gonna use to land on the moon. And then there's the command module, which is on the right-hand side. And as you can see, the command module has exploded uh, and it's not gonna work well um, anymore. And when this happened, uh, the, the people on board had lost most of their oxygen and they had to find a way to turn the lunar module, which is meant to hold people for a few hours into their home for a matter of, uh, of a week or so. So um, I actually like this example because you can think about these as essentially two monoliths. Um, each one is completely self-contained. It has all of its own systems, its own life support systems, et cetera. And uh, I like this for, you, for, for, there's, for explaining microservices because there's this moment where after where they realize that these two different monoliths use two completely different uh, sized oxygen uh, carbon uh, filters. And they need these to get rid of the carbon dioxide that they're breathing out in order to not die. And so there's this great moment in the film Apollo 13 when they say, we need to make this fit into this using only the stuff that's on the spacecraft and they have to figure out how to do it and teach them how to do it so they can stay alive. And I like this example as monoliths because I feel like if they had a microservice based approach, you know, these, and of course, this is what they did later is they were like, oh, we should think of oxygen as a service and uh, it's gonna work in a universal way. So all our filters are gonna work no matter what, you know, uh, monolith that they're plugged into. So this is kind of a, a fun example of, of microservices and it shows that you can create things one time and use them over and over again. Um, and that's really valuable, right? Uh, so um, that, that's, my, that's my brief example or analogy about why microservices, uh, most people, you know, kind of understand the value of microservices. Of course, it allows you to scale as well. Um, a few years ago, Expedia went through this process where they had multiple monoliths, and, and this had happened because they'd acquired several companies. They were uh, they had cars, different cars services that they had acquired, and they had completely different monoliths, different UIs, different UXs, different databases, and so they went through a big rearchitecture to make all of these uh, into a group of microservices that they could use across their entire platform. And that was the goal, right? Um, now, anybody that's done this kind of work before knows that it's uh, it's fairly complex to achieve. Um, but uh, this is the, the experience that they had. Um, first of all, they decided that they wanted to consolidate all those code bases. They wanted to build sh uh, shared libraries for global platforms. And uh, shared libraries are a fairly common kind of approach to this thing because it feels more microservice-y, but we'll get into issues uh, with that. Um, and then they wanted to rely on manual integration testing, uh, which turned out to be a big problem because once you've split up into lots of microservices, you've created a lot more, uh, a lot more areas, you know, attack surface, if you will, to test. Um, they did want to standardize their CI/CD pipeline, and they wanted to use Maven for modularity. But there were a lot of issues with this approach because one, all the teams were geographically distributed, so it was just difficult to get everybody you know, on the same page, it was difficult to get everybody to say to, to pick the same tools. Everybody knows that organizational inertia is one of the biggest challenges you have. And they ended up with way too many pipelines. Instead of having 100 pipelines, they had 1000 
plus pipelines all of a sudden to try to manage for all these different microservices they were creating. Um, and of course, those pipelines were not modular or reusable. So every time somebody wanted to change something, it meant going and updating, you know, a thousand pipelines. Um, and we're going to get into these issues more specifically. Of course, they were using Jenkins. So they said they had a lot of master slave issues. Um, and then they had a lot of copy and paste going on uh, as this process started. Um, so jumping right into the microservices, I think there was a big understanding about the value of microservices from an architectural standpoint, but there was, um, there was definitely a lot to be learned in terms of how microservices work within a development context. Uh, so <clears throat> um, one of the things they learned is that they should have prioritized the CICD and development process much higher because that ultimately became the biggest bottleneck um, once, they, once they kind of had re-architected. Um, and they needed to find a, uh, an easier way to bootstrap new projects um, and they needed to find a way to do more reusability. So these are a lot of learnings from some kind of deep in the trenches um, pains of if you go from a couple of monoliths to hundreds or thousands of microservices, how do you approach it? So we're actually gonna go through these more granularly. And um, this kind of goes into how we actually do this internally at CodeFresh because we have a complex microservice stack. Um, so first of all, when you organize pipelines for a monolithic application, traditionally what you have, and this is the traditional view, is you do one project, one pipeline, one repo. And this makes perfect sense, right? You're, you have a, 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 a pipeline for every repo and each, each application has its own repo um, and that works great. Now, the issue with that, of course, is that what if you have, uh, if you have you know, a monolithic application, that's fine. You don't have that many repos, you don't have that many apps. But if you take that app and you split it into 500 microservices, now you have to maintain 500 pipelines. Now you have to maintain 500 different Git repos. And this can be really complex to manage. Um, and this, this is also usually led by a single team, which is very anti DevOps. The whole purpose of this is to put more power into the hands of the developers so they can take more of the process um, and have more control over what's being deployed, what's being tested, what's being built, what's being released. Um, so you can see there's a clear issue of scalability. If you take all of these different repos and each one splits into potentially four different microservices, you end up with a ton of repos and a ton of pipelines. So this does not feel like a very good plan. Um, of course, if you look at the largest companies, Microsoft and Google both do mono repo, though at a scale that is sort of mind boggling. I'm not necessarily recommending that right off the bat, but um, but there are some big advantages to starting to get into something like that. This isn't a talk advocating for monorepo, but it's more, uh, th but, but that is um, one potential avenue to help, one, one potential tool. Um, the other the issue here as well is that shared libraries is not a solution. So uh, there's a big thought that it's like, okay, well, we have to make a ton of pipelines. And what we'll do is we'll create a bunch of shared libraries so we can use these pipeline segments in all these different pipelines. And so we can construct pipelines from all these different shared libraries and this will work well. Um, and uh, if anybody who has experience doing this knows that this is actually not a great solution because these libraries rely on each other in very complex ways. So uh, first of all, this requires everyone to use the same version of these libraries. Um, and it, re it requires them all to use the same underlying software. So for example, if library A is using one version of, uh, I don't know, Java, library B has to use that as well because when they're gonna execute in a pipeline, they're gonna execute inside of a shared VM kind of environment. So this, this creates a lot of conflicts. Um, and and if, you've, if you've ever experienced like, uh, I wanna upgrade a Jenkins plugin, you've run into this issue, right? You've noticed that all of a sudden these things start behaving in very abnormal ways and a lot of things start breaking. So they rely on each other in very complex ways. And then it also means that any changes to those shared libraries have to go to admins. So people can't necessarily self-serve the components or tools they need. And if they do want to change versions of something, of course, they have to talk to an admin and say, hey, I want to change the version. I have to, you know, the, my application I'm using, I need to use this version the underlying software is using this version, we need to reconcile those things. And now all of a sudden, instead of a conversation between you and just the admins, there's five other teams using different shared libraries that all will have to upgrade as well. So this becomes 
you know, a nightmare to manage. Um, so it becomes a big stability problem. And of course, it also usually relies on a proprietary API. So it's not, um, it's not something you can just build and use uh, anywhere. It's not agnostic, right? So um, I'm going to get into how we actually approach this internally at CodeFresh. We have a complex microservice stack. Um, and we essentially have three things that we've really learned have been battle tested, tried and true that work really well. Container based pipelines, shared pipelines and deployment testing make a huge difference when you're doing CICD for microservices. Um, so first of all, here's our, here's our uh, architecture. This is a little bit out of date, but what you can see is that we have to support uh, we, our kind of position as a CI/CD platform is that we are Git and cloud agnostic. So we're going to work really well with any Git provider. We're going to work really well with any cloud provider. And of course, we have to integrate with every single testing tool, security tool in between um, and monitoring solutions so that everything works smoothly. So that's a complex stack. We've got a ton of different microservices, a few dozen different microservices we're using to do that. And we have dozens of different runtimes we need to support. Um, we also have like an on-prem version of CodeFresh. We have a, a CodeFresh runner, which is like a, a zero trust, deploy it on your own cluster and, and run builds and pipelines as much as you want. Uh, kind of model in addition to the SaaS model. So this, this means we have a lot of different um, variability that we have to be able to support. Uh, so our approach to um, building microservices, uh, it takes this into account. So first off, uh, one of the things we do is we do container-based pipelines. So this has gotten very popular in the last few years. If you haven't heard of using container-based pipelines, um, uh, it might be a bit of a shock, I suppose, but um, basically the idea is that every single step within the pipeline should be its own container. It should be its own image. Now, what does that mean? It means that those images, those steps do not rely on each other. I can have one version of Java in one step and another version in another step, and they are not going to interact with each other in any way. Um, and this, this actually allows you uh, in a certain sense, it allows you to think of almost every step as a microservice, if you will. Um, but what, we, what you have is, is basically building blocks. And these images don't rely on any proprietary API. These can be any language. You can write them in any language you're comfortable with, and they can do whatever job that they need to do. Um, and of course, people can self-serve these. There's hundreds of thousands of different Docker images out there publicly available that you can take and grab and use for different jobs. And building Docker images is like wicked easy. It's very, very simple. Um, so the way that we manage this inside of CodeFresh is we actually create uh, on the pipeline a shared volume. Now, the way you handle the shared volume is pretty important. Um, what we do is essentially that shared volume lives on the local SSD for the build node, but it is also cached and refreshed no matter where the pipeline execution is happening. Uh, so that means I have really high performance IO in between the steps, but I also get all the benefits of caching without doing any additional configuration, which is really killer. So it basically means your pipelines are going to be super fast by default. Um, <clears throat> we have a huge open source library of steps at codefresh.io slash steps. These are all essentially Docker images with a schema attached to them um, that you could take and use uh, in uh, really any platform. Um, these are, of course, designed for CodeFresh, but you could take them and execute them locally uh, to, to use any of these steps yourself. These are essentially just Docker images. And uh, again, they do have a schema that describes what they do and what their outputs are and that kind of thing. But um, you could basically take these and run these locally to do any of the things you want to do. And these are all open source, all these steps are. Um, the other thing that we recommend is using a single pipeline that operates with a context. So what this means is that rather than having one pipeline per repo, I can create one pipeline and then each repository that I want to have execute with that pipeline will just have its own trigger. So if repo A has a change, that's a trigger. If repo B has a change, that's a different trigger, right? And those triggers come with the context of, of where that application is being built from. So it says, hey, this is the repo that's changing. These are the changes that are being made, da, 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 all these things. Um, and they can bring more context to them. They can even have descriptions about which deployment environments they're supposed to use. They can have descriptions of what testing should be done. Uh, so this means that you can basically create a pipeline that is contextually aware enough to operate 
hundreds or even thousands of different services. Um, so if I want to upgrade or make a change, very simple. I can, I can make it right there. If somebody wants to split this off and fork it and make their own version, that's very easy too. Because again, all of these steps are just Docker images. So I can, uh, I can actually take the pipeline, replicate it, and make uh, additional changes if I don't want to use a centralized pipeline. Um, so this makes it very easy to work. And so if you think about what's on your code base, you have tests, you might have a Docker Compose, you might have Helm charts, you might have dependencies, all those things. Those all come with the trigger. So once the trigger pushes uh, and tells the pipeline to execute, the pipeline has all of the information it needs to do at what is essentially a fairly flexible pipeline execution. Um, it's going to build a Docker image, right? It's going to build whatever Docker image the code base tells it to. Maybe it's going to spin up a Docker Compose for running tests, and it's going to spin up whatever composition is described and whatever tests are described within the repo. Um, so this means you can essentially write your automation once, and then if you just follow the sort of you know syntax within all your other repos, then you have a, a very straightforward, um, simple way of executing uh, pipelines for hundreds or thousands of microservices. And this is a very, very scalable approach. Um, so I'm going to show you a very quick demo of how we do this in CodeFresh. I'm going to actually show you our internal CI process. Uh, so um, I'm going to go over into the CodeFresh platform here. And you can see I'm actually looking at uh, projects. I'm looking at CodeFresh pipelines. And uh, you know we've got a bunch of pipelines in here. But I'm going to show you the CI one. We do have a CD one as well. But within the CI pipeline, and I'll actually show you one of these executions here. Um, so here's the, uh, here you can see there's actually a build currently running. Looks like Safi is uh, getting a, a deployment going, which is great. Love to see that. Um, let's look at the workflow really quick. Uh, now this workflow is actually stored inside of a repo where we keep uh, a number of different pipelines. Um, and so you can see that the YAML is defined here and it's actually taken from that location. Now, what you'll see on the left here is the definition of the pipeline. You can see there are a number of different hooks. Um, there's different success criteria. And then, of course, we get into the steps. And you can see here where we're doing a, um, where we're actually cloning our uh, repo. We've hard coded that it's always going to clone from our organization. But then the repo name and the branch uh, and, and all the secrets and everything, all of these are variable. Uh, so, depending on what trigger is pushing, all of these will uh, check out, these would essentially check out different repos based on that. Now on the right hand side, you can see all of the different triggers that we have um, for all the different services that are running off of this uh, CI pipeline. So this allows us, again, we created one pipeline. We have dozens of different CI services, uh, uh, sorry, uh, dozens of different microservices that are actually triggering changes in here. And of course we do support all the secrets and stuff like that. And if we, uh, if we look at a build really quick, um, we can see what uh, we can see what Safi's up to here. Um, so you can see it's cloned our repo. Uh, it's setting different variables. Um, looks like he's got some validation version issues. In this case, this one does not create a PR because it has not passed that uh, version criteria. Um, it installs some test dependencies, running unit tests, composition tests. Looks like it. Uh, oh, at this point, it's going to add some pull requests to image enricher. But it looks like he didn't pass his security scan, so his pipeline has been marked as failed. So um, that means he gets the feedback right away, right? That's, just, that's exactly what you want. Uh, so essentially what, what we do is we have a big shared CI pipeline that executes for all the different services. And then uh, as part of that pipeline, it actually creates a pull request onto a repository where it generates the manifests that are going into deployment. And then that's managed by our CD pipeline. Um, so what you'll see here is that all of these triggers are actually off of the same repo. So you might be thinking, wait, 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 how do I have multiple triggers for one repo? Well, the answer is that each of these triggers has filters on it. Um, so each of these triggers basically has a filter that says, uh, only trigger when there are changes made to this subfolder. So this is kind of the mono repo support. And this is actually pretty important when you're doing GitOps because GitOps uh, basically prescribes that your application and your infrastructure um, uh, manifests should usually be separate. Um, this allows you to make changes to your application, which then trigger the generation of manifests, which are put into a separate repo, reviewed in a separate pull request, 
uh, and allows you to um, continue the CI/CD process. So you can see these are all essentially working off of um, one chart repository, uh, one, one Git repo that has all our different Helm charts in it. And we're basically generating and making changes to those um, charts, which is then triggering the actual deployment into production. So you can, you can see how this would be a very scalable way to do this. And of course, we can support hundreds or thousands of microservices uh, doing that. Um, one last note here is, is about deployment verification. So uh, I don't know if any of you caught the last talk um, that uh, I, sorry, the speaker's name escapes me, but she was speaking about Istio and talking about doing canary releases and things like that. One of the issues that happens with microservices is that as your infrastructure becomes more complex, the usefulness of early testing goes down. So when, you're, when your application stack is, you know, three or four microservices, you can throw those all into like a, like a Docker Compose and actually spin it up as part of the pipeline, run the whole thing and, uh, and basically, excuse me, actually burn it in and test it. But when you have thousands of microservices and some of those are, are even external services like, you know, maybe the uh, Salesforce API or whatever, spinning up that entire sp stack for every single change starts to become less and less reasonable. Um, so what we do recommend is that you actually go with something like a Canary deployment. And of course, a Canary deployment will, uh, when you release something, it'll release a small change and, uh, and then test it and move up over and over until it's actually reached 100% of the traffic that your customers are, are doing. And if at any point there's an issue, it'll catch it, block it, and rebirth the change. Um, and so this is something that we, we advocate pretty heavily. Um, there's a pretty good talk about this uh, linked here at, uh, I'll throw it in the chat, I think. Oh, it was, it was uh, Lin Sun. Yes, thank you again, Lin Sun, for that, that great talk. Um, let me, oh, I lost my mouse. Oh, here we go. I'll throw this uh, link in the chat here. Thanks for telling me. There you are. Um, so that uh, that is another you know avenue that I do recommend getting into, um, though uh, though there's uh, not quite time to get deep into that <laughs> into that uh, topic during this talk. Um, so in summary, uh, shared pipelines are certainly much much better than shared libraries. Um, highly recommend those. I think that they're much stronger. Um, and uh, again, using reusable Docker images, that's much, much better than copy and pasting between lots of different uh, pipelines because you get all this drift and stuff like that. Um, reusable Docker images basically mean people can self-serve the images um, with the versions that they want. And, and I'll give you an example with Terraform. Uh, Terraform famously does usually not like to work between different versions of itself. Um, and with, uh, with our CodeFresh Steps library, which I'll show you really quick, uh, we actually have a Terraform uh, step in here. Um, and that Terraform step, I can just self-serve whatever version uh, that I want um, for my pipeline. So if I'm using a different version of Terraform, it's not gonna require you know, another team to upgrade all their stuff to use that. Um, and then finally, deployment validation with Canary is definitely a, a really strong direction to go in. I highly recommend that. Um, to get to Canary, of course, you have to have great CI and you have to have great CD. And, and if you don't have those things in place, then you're not going to be able to do Canary. So I do recommend that. Um, there is a longer form blog post about this talk. So if you want to refer to that, I'll throw that in the chat as well. It's a, it's a great resource. And it was put together um, by Costas Capilonis, who's a... a a guy on my team who's fantastic. You can follow him on Twitter at CodePipes. Uh, and with that, I will open the floor to questions and uh, would be thrilled if any of you want to try that out. Um, you can try it out on our platform, but of course you can take those, pra those best practices and uh, try to build them into um, you know, whatever tools you're using today. So with that, questions. Watching the chat here. Uh, I'm not seeing the resources in Zoom chat. Oh, that's because I'm posted them to panelists. So that was not very smart of me. Let me do panelists and attendees. There you go. There is both the, uh, the Canary deployment talk that I refer to using Istio and Helm and the uh, blog post on CICD pipelines. Thank you, Joshua, for, for pointing that out. Um, while you're thinking of questions, one of the questions I often get um, 
Oh yeah, <laughs> thanks thanks for reposting the uh, the link to the uh, Apollo thirteen. <laughs> um, one of the questions I often get about this is uh, essentially how do you handle uh, you know once these things are all running, how do you actually know what's going on? Like if you have thousands of microservices, doesn't it get hard to tell what's going on? And the answer is yeah, it does get hard. Um, this is something that we've actually been working a lot on. Uh, because if you're deploying to thousands of different microservices and you're deploying dozens of times of times per day, um, that can be really complex. And so uh, one of the things we've been talking a lot about is essentially how you bring in observability. How do you bring in logs and metrics into that process? Um, and then how do you get insight into uh, how do you get insight into what's actually available? And so like in our platform, what we built, is um actually i don't want to show you it in this one but I'll show you in this what we actually built is a view of all your runtime environments and applications uh so you can actually see what's running actually i don't have a ton in this one let me do well yeah you can see it anyway um so you can see for example i have this cluster and i can see all the different services that i've deployed and if i had actually uh if these were actually running through the cluster, I would actually be able to see links to um, like the deployments and the images and all those kinds of things. So there's a lot of different kind of metrics things that we try to do to make visibility front and center so people know what's going on at all times. Uh, Cody asks, you mentioned complexity of shared library as you consolidate many smaller pipelines into fewer larger ones. Could you like highlight some of the indicators you've witnessed that bring those shared libraries under scrutiny? Uh, yeah, so the shared libraries problem is most often experienced in version drift. So uh, I want to use one version um, of something and another tool wants to use a different version. And so now we have to reconcile because those shared libraries have to execute essentially within the same workspace. They're, they're executing within the same VM. So I can't have different versions of Java installed. Um, and, and different versions of Java between those two things. And so if you like if you're looking for indicators like are you afraid of what will happen if you upgrade a version within a shared library? If you are, then that probably means that shared libraries are a constraint and a bottleneck before you because it means you have a complex relationship between shared libraries that you don't fully understand, but you expect will potentially break. Um, if you're dreading upgrading something like that because of it, that's a really good indication. Another thing that I see a lot of, and this is actually a security concern. Um, I wrote a blog post about this called, um, this is kind of controversial, um, Reasons Jenkins Fails. Yeah, this, this blog post right here, I'll throw in. This is kind of controversial, uh, maybe because of the image I stuck at the top of it. <laughs> but um, one of the issues that happens uh, with this is that, um, is that uh, people will start proliferating different uh, masters in order to handle um, a version conflict. So like I wanna use one version of Java and someone else wants to use a different one. So rather than reconciling, I'm gonna split off and create a new Jenkins master that I have to manage. And uh, so I can install the version that I want. And um, what, what we've, I've actually seen at companies, I've seen companies that have thousands of different um, uh, masters that they're all trying to manage and almost all of them are way out of date. Uh, so this creates a big problem. Um, from the uh, chat and I'll alternate between the, the Q and A and the chat here. Um, from the chat, would there be a scenario of circular dependency of unified pipeline script given that we use a single pipeline for all repos and any additional step required for one single repo script? Um, there shouldn't be any circular dependencies when you're using a shared pipeline like that. Um, the, only, the only scenario in which that would happen is if your output from that pipeline was modifying another repo that is also on the CI pipeline. So I mentioned that we actually separate out um, the infrastructure, uh, like, the, um, like the deployment manifests and the application, the application description, those are in two different repositories. So everything that executes over here executes on the CI pipeline and it generates pull requests onto our infrastructure repos, which then go through a, a different process. So that way we don't ever go through any kind of uh, circular dependency. 
Ashok asks, what tools and frameworks do you use for observability? Um, so we actually, uh, I, uh, we, we, we work with a number of different logging providers and uh, I'm, we have some stuff internally that we do that basically overlays performance and metrics on top of our uh, pipelines. And this is something that we're working on right now, releasing to the public. And so you should actually see it in our platform um, released for other people in the next uh, couple of weeks. Keep it on the DL. We haven't announced it yet. So just, you know, just between us friends here. Um, another question uh, comes from Casey. Nix, NixOS happily runs multiple versions of codes in shared libraries if that's a problem you have and don't want to get into Docker. Um, I haven't tried Nix and NixOS, and that, that certainly is a, a, an interesting recommendation. Um, my, my hesitation with, with that would be, and, and, I, and I also want to separate out, I'm talking about containers, and Docker and containers used to be this, you know, kind of synonymous. And sometimes I talk to people who are like, oh, I don't, I don't use Docker at all. I just use containers. I just use them on a different runtime. Um, that's totally fine. Uh, I'm not making any, any specific Docker recommendations here. Um, I'm really just talking about uh, any, uh, you know, OCI compliant image that you want to use. Um, Andrew asks, what are the hardware requirements for CodeFresh? We have had scaling problems with concourse garden workers with a lot of task containers are launched at the same time. Um, so this, uh, this actually comes, this is actually a really big strength for us. Um, we are a Kubernetes native platform, so we really take advantage of the Kubernetes primitives. Um, if uh, I can install the CodeFresh runner on a very minimalist small cluster, and um, if I, I can basically throw pipelines at that all day long, and it will uh, it will spin up as many pods as there are uh, pipelines that need to be executed. And if your Kubernetes cluster is set up with like auto scaling, it'll just add nodes and execute. Um, and this works really really well. Um, if, if, if I had more time, I would show you really quick, uh, but it's pretty rad. Um, I would recommend if you want to see this um, at codefresh.io, there is at the very top of the page, the Codefresh runner here. Um, try this guy out. It'll, uh, it'll, it's really easy to install, get up and running. Um, and what I actually did is uh, to test this is I made a bash script. Uh, called spam pipelines. <laughs> and all it does is uh, run, it runs code fresh run pipeline. And then it just does it as many times as I tell it to do it. And I've put in a, a bucket of executions in there and it will spin up and execute uh, as many, um, you know, nodes on my cluster as I need. So I, I've seen really great scalability with this. And uh, I've seen it also from our customers, not just in my, my, my uh, you know, sort of silly uh, uh, test scenario. <laughs> um, Good question. Coming back over, uh, what other tools would you recommend using if you are using Jenkins for CI/CD? Um, well, we don't use Jenkins. Obviously, we we're CodeFresh is a, is essentially a replacement for Jenkins. So I don't know that I would have a whole lot of recommendations. I would say deployment operators are certainly really interesting. Um, we're doing a lot of work with Argo CD. Um, we really like that open source project, and we've been contributing to it for, for a while, and it's something that we've been building also into our platform. So that's definitely a, one that I would recommend checking out as well. Um, Yibu asks, any thoughts about deploying serverless functions instead of containers? Is there anything you will change in pipelines architecture in general? Uh, so I think functions are great. Uh, no, no problem with that. Um, Deploying serverless functions actually are deploying containers. 99% of the time on 99% of the platforms is actually is a container underneath. Um, it's just a matter of how you want to describe it. So I don't really think it changes a whole lot about the deployment pattern. I think you still want to have probably a CI and a CD uh, kind of uh, process and that you want to have probably your, um, your code uh, repos and your sort of infrastructure repos that you're making changes to. So when you make a change to your application, you basically open up a pull request to um, your functions library, which then actually syncs it and deploys it. Um, it's what I would recommend. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't think it, it really changes anything too dramatically. I think it uh, maybe just simplifies what kind of manifest you need to manage. And depending on what platform you're using, um, you know, you might be running your serverless platform on top of Kubernetes, um, or you might be using a, a, a provider like a, a cloud providers, you know, built-in serverless platform. Either case, I don't think it changes the the math um, too 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 directly. Awesome. 
Well, it looks like uh, we answered all the questions. Hopefully uh, none of that was too, uh, if it was controversial, hopefully uh, it was at least something to learn from and, uh, and valuable. Um, again, I do recommend trying this stuff out. We've seen, uh, we actually, I, I mentioned kind of the, the way that um, shared pipelines work. And since we have a second, um, one thing that I would really recommend trying to learn this is if I go and execute, let me see if I actually have one sitting right here. I think I actually have a cool way to show this. Um, yeah, and I can't remember if I, uh, actually I actually haven't run this in a little while, but let me try to run this guy. Check out my settings, make sure this isn't uh, some runtime that I've removed. Yeah, okay. So one, one way that I can just show you the way this, um, this shared pipeline works is I'm gonna run this in debug mode and this will actually allow me to put in breakpoints into my pipeline and then interact with it in real time. Um, I haven't messed with this pipeline in a while, so uh, we'll see if it, if it works well. And I can't remember if this account is even set up properly. But uh, I'm gonna set up a, uh, looks like I've already got some breakpoints set up to override these different steps. Um, so I can set breakpoints before, during uh, a, a step execution or afterwards. And this will actually show you, um, I think in a really direct way, how those volumes work. So if you think about it, I've got Go tooling, Java tooling, .NET tooling. They're all separate, right? I'm not executing them together. Um, and let's see if we've, we've initialized here, rocking and rolling. Yeah, once it starts this step, then it will drop me into the debug. So all of these steps are executing within their own container. Now, again, this isn't something that's Docker specific. These could be uh, just any OCI compliant containers. They're gonna execute exactly the same. Doesn't, doesn't matter what the runtime is. Um, and this will actually allow me to create these steps that are completely separate and execute in a completely separate way. Um, so there's no conflict, there's no execution between them, and there's no uh, dependency between these platforms. So if one component um, is using you know, one version, it's not gonna be an issue on another version. Um, so here, yeah, I've, I've dropped into my step here. And uh, let's see if you can see that I am within the shared volume, you can see what's in here. I can create, um, Create a go link thing here, and if I run go, go version, you can see that goes here. But Java won't be, .NET won't be, right? They're not found. Um, so I, let's say I'm happy. I'm going to move on. It's now going to move me on uh, into my next debug step, which is in this Java container. So it's actually going to spin that up. So you can see I'm basically moving in and out of containers, right? Um, so here it's now set up my next workspace. And here, if I try to run Go version, it's not going to work because Go is not installed in this container, right? But Java is. So uh, Java, I can't remember the syntax on Java. It's like Java dash B or Java Helm. I can never remember the syntax on Java. I don't use Java very much. And Java is like the weird one. It uses like the, you know, uh, <laughs> It's like the way that it checks for version is is some some bizarre. Oh, is it just version? No, it's something. It's it's different than that. Anyway, we don't have to get into it. But you get the idea. I think this explains it um, fairly well. So, oh, everybody, everybody in the chat's like yelling at me. All the all the people that use Java all the time are like, oh my gosh, uh, Java dash v. No, Java dash version. Oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, it's Java dash version. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, so, so yeah, we can see that Java works, and of course, GoLang, uh, Go, Go does not work, right? Because Go is not in this container. So you can see they're actually separate containers, but they're executing within the shared volume. And if I check this volume, you can see where I ex exported this GoLang text. Um, and this is cool again because it's actually executing on a local SSD. So the I/O is really fast. We actually uh, had a customer who gave a talk at KubeCon last year, and their build times went from like an hour and a half to like 12 minutes because they just had a lot of IO requirements in between the steps. And they were using a, uh, like a network drive before and that just the IO was so slow that their pipeline executions were, were really slow. And of course, everything that I do here is gonna be cached um, though 
though not within the debug actually within the debug it won't be cached but uh, a normal pipeline execution would be anyway i think that gives you a pretty good idea go try it out it's a lot of fun um, it's a fun way to build pipelines too uh, and with that i think we'll come to a close and uh, really appreciate you attending the talk um, if you liked it or you didn't like it, hit me up on Twitter at Today Was Awesome. Interested to hear your feedback. If you think I could have done something better, let me know. If you think I did something really great, love to hear that even more. <laughs> With that, I'll pass it back over to uh, our moder moderator.